Member Poets. So guys, if you could just introduce yourselves to start with. I'm Simon. I'm Genevieve. I'm Matt. I'm Marina. Hi guys. So you guys are all a collective of poets. So first thing I want to know is how did you actually come together? Who started this? It was myself and a colleague Ralph who's in Lindisfarne today. He couldn't be with us unfortunately. And we were at Glastonbury a few years ago and we went to see the spoken word tent at Glastonbury. And there were loads of poets in there and it was really like self-indulgent, inclusive stuff. Basically like poetry that was intended for people who'd studied poetry for years and if you're not into poetry you won't understand it. And we were a bit annoyed by it and we wanted to start something that presented poetry, something that was accessible. So like you guys have never seen poetry before and you get it and it's accessible and it, it's, not, it's not dumbing it down, it, it, it's just... It's just making it more fun and enjoyable and where you can listen to a poem once and know what it's all about. So it's actually doing the opposite, it's not doing it down, it's, no, it's no, opening no. it up a bit more it, and, exactly. and making it more enjoyable for those that don't get it yeah. and understand. So that's why we formed the Further Poets, there's about ten of us in total, four of us in I was going to ask, I was going to ask if there was any more of you, I think it was just the four of you. You all perform your own poems, but is there a kind of theme, is there sort of a rule when it comes to writing a poem that you're going to perform under your, your collective name, or is it just that you kind of all write what you feel you need to write about? I don't think we've ever been bound by rules particularly on what we have to write, uh, nor on what we perform, uh, but as every performance poet has this quandary, you do have to make a distinction between what's good to perform and what isn't. Some things make it just better on the page, and that's why we have a book out for those particular poems that are better on the page than the stage. Okay, do you guys have anything else that you sort of putting out for other people, or do you do you release anything exclusively, or is it just a case of you're a live performance that, that perform as a collective? Well, we hold a, a monthly uh, open mic event over in Pudsey, a really, really nice place called Cafe Books, and what we try to do with that is not only showcase uh, prolific poets, but also to make sure that people who've never tried it before can have a go and get involved. Uh, and other than that, we have, we have a book out, and we have an ongoing publication online of all the upcoming poets that are going to work with us on the tour, right. including all of our um, workshop members. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. Cheers. Cheers. Hi, everyone. We're Fervent Poets. It's a delight to be here today. I'm going to open with a poem called Last Grenade. Put your cards on the table and set them aflame. The world is beige. It's midday soap opera builds this life. There are things you need to explain. You, you see, are a Leonard Cohen song that was too hard to write so you were left unsung. You're a glitch in the matrix, and if they don't get that reference, mate, they're too young. You're the taste in the mouth after three days of drinking. The crease in the brow when an armed man is thinking, do I pull the trigger or give myself in? You're the blow to a bystander's chin in a fight. You're the endless night in which rats run amok and sick bargains are made. You're the A-bomb in heaven. You are a last grenade. You're the girl next door supposing you live next to Satan himself, the record too extreme for Charles Manson's shelf, and here you sit awaiting an answer. After thousands of years on the warpath, slaughtering those with debts unpaid, less of a woman and more of a last grenade, put your cards on the table and set them aflame. Aware that you are a buyer they will never tame. The answer could be no or yes, and the lino cracks and the concrete crumbles and the earth on your behalf feels sore until you hear the right answer, which is, my love, tell me more. Thank you. Of you who didn't meet us downstairs at our show, it's an absolute pleasure to be here at Unity Works today. We're a firm of poets. I'm Genevieve Walsh, and my compadres for today Mr. Matt Abbott, Ms. Marina Popper, and first of all, field adaptation, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Simon Winnett. This one's about an American holiday that Britain seems to lovely, lovingly adopt last year. 11, 59, and 56 seconds, just a few seconds more. But the surge is starting to swell at that front door. Get bouncing on those toes. I'm here. We go. Make a beeline for that bulk display. Let a bloodlust boil. Because no one is getting in your way. Punches and kicks and anger now screams. After all, you are saving 10% of that LCD TV. Arms scratched, eyes gouged, a ripped clothes line the floor. After all, you need that PlayStation 4. An ocean of limbs and walking wounded across the shop. Some have taken to heart, shop, till you drop. But where was this scene? You sit there and ponder. Just where did those sheep go to squander? 
Was it in some soaked California or a mountain strewn Colorado? Try a drizzle drenched battery, more specifically, Tesco. Thank you. When I was younger and prettier, I used to work in hostels in London, mostly um, housing men who had been homeless for a very long time. And if people remember the 80s, that was a time when um, hospitals for people with mental health problems were emptied, the old asylums were turfed out, and people were um, set free, but a lot of them ended up on the streets, sadly, and then back in our hostels. Um, this is a love story, a, a, a love song to those men, and it's a true story. Tired pain peels off Regency railings, Upstairs, Bob is gently wailing. You fumble for a mint. Go over your line, stub out your cig on the no smoking sign. Stone steps sag, where once they stood proud, worn down, battered, broken, cowed. Anxious and sweaty, you reach for the bell, suck hard on that mint, preparing to tell why you came. Why you needed to know the fate of those men that lived here long ago. Fresh-faced youth looks a little harassed, checks out your story, allows you to pass. Oh, Jesus, that smell. It's not one you can miss. Dettol, dishcloth, stale pizza and piss. With a hint of Febreze, an attempt to put right all the long days of drinking and the chain-smoking nights and all those hollow-eyed men with their faraway smiles. You don't notice so much when you've been there a while. But what were you expecting? If time waits for no man, then it won't linger here. Where lives are lived out on Largato and beer. Where Bob's bony fingers pick butts off the floor because he spent all his dosh on dogs and the draw. Where Jim's hollow cheeks haven't eaten for weeks and the chemical kosh keeps the leery ones meek. Wolves are magnolia with accents of grime. Windows replaced for the umpteenth time. Cheap plastic flowers in cheap plastic mugs. Fake velvet curtains, chipped coffee mugs. Will you marry me, darling? Bob asks. And I smile. You don't notice so much when you've been here a while. So what of those men? What of Norman and Billy and Beryl and John? Surely they can't be. They can't all be gone. You really did care for those clapped out old men, and I guess life must have seemed pretty simple back then. You'd learned so little from living and mostly from books, not the real hardcore knowledge that comes with the knocks. But I wanted to tell them that I never forgot their stories, their quirks, their loose grip on the plot, and that if time was turned back that I'd listen to their voices, and I mean really listen, show respect for their choices. I'd help them speak out, speak their truth, shout it loud, I'd say, chins up loud, chests out, be yourselves and be proud. Thank you. Fashion icons line the wall as punters patiently blink. There's a six pound slogan t-shirt, luminous green or neon pink. It's a drunken culinary kingdom, it's an existential sin. If you've never left at 4am with gravy on your chin. Bouncers awkwardly avert their eyes as they keep the peace in pairs. Yeah, you heard that right, folks. Two bouncers on the stairs. Because if there's only one steak pie left, then the rest is vegetarian. We're heading for a performance chapter, and it's going to be a scary and synthesised riffs from the galaxy above as drunken tiffs put pride before love in the restaurant room with the picnic benches. No, ladies and gents, just wallies and wenches. Tell you what I fancy, love. I'll have a bottle of Vex from the fridge. Because you all might have stopped drinking, but I'm from Aubrey Bridge. And yeah, I will have great love. Have you got any bangers and mash? Oh, wait, wait, two minutes like I need to get some cash. You spent the evening delivering a sermon praising pie shop chips. As you climbed the stairs I saw the salivation on your lips. You grasped upon a styrene tray that's fit to feed a horse and then go and bloody douse the things in fake tomato sauce. And you might have pecs and tats and tans and haircuts from the navy. But I've seen you sitting sheepishly with chips and cheese and gravy. If you go to the pie shop and actively avoid the pie, do not expect to meet me soon and look me in the eye. You can go to the head with all you want for your arty farty needs. If you're really feeling cultured why not catch the train to Leeds? But if you want the jewel crown in the Wakefield Westgate story is the drunken culinary kingdom in all its gravy, glutton, glory. Cheers. <laughs>